So our next speaker, and you're going to get your you're going to get your full time. Didn't. <laughs> and we've got a bio for everybody in the book too, so we haven't spent a lot of time on it. Dave Dixon comes from IBM, and he's going to tell us some neat stuff today. A good segue into that, by the way. Uh, so yeah, David Dixon. Um, and just uh, uh, my caveat is I'm neither a, a geologist or a data scientist. I'm actually, my undergraduate was in space engineering, so um, probably the closest I can do is help you uh, mine asteroids. But what we'll talk about is how IBM is, is using data, obviously, from a geo, uh, physical geo, ge geological perspective and some use cases associated with that with some of our end users and present some of the technologies that can help do a lot of the heavy lifting but also provide that integrated view from unstructured and structured data and some of the outcomes we've had, uh, some successes, particularly with the Gold Corp, which I'll, I'll provide later. Um, so that's my background. So I worked at IBM, uh, their industry strategy consulting leader for part of the business that looks at mining minerals, uh, metals, pulp, paper, cement, uh, engineering, construction, industrial machinery. Um, and just to give a little bit of background on IBM, so IBM's had a lot of transformation, and, and this will be a lighter presentation, it won't deep dive into the, the core uh, academic uh, and, and data science and geology and so forth, but it'll be a bit more of a lighter, higher level view of how, how some of this stuff can start to abstract and help through the practice of geology. Um, IBM's gone through many transformations. We started with tabulated machines, typewriters and the barcode and so forth. In fact, that's where the IBM logos come from. But now we're very much a business that's focused on delivering industry solutions using what we call cognitive technologies deployed in the cloud. By cognitive, we talk about, I guess, the, the management of, of analytics through to artificial intelligence, machine learning and probabilistic weighting through to deep, uh, deep learning and neural, neural uh, networks and so forth. And, and the, the collective uh, assembly of those technologies and math is what, where we, we view being cognitive capabilities. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later. So in the context of mining, we are building out a, a cognitive value chain of what we call cognitive advisors, particularly focused on some of the high value areas in geology at the moment, where we're seeing, particularly again in gold, uh, a lot of pull through and interest in how Watson as a technology, which is uh, our brand for cognitive capabilities, is starting to really help and drive efficiencies in, in geological analysis and, uh, and the management of a lot, lot of unstructured data, whether that's theses from 60 years ago that are embedded in some uh, PDF or, or other uh, non-structured data format, or whether that's emails and so forth, as well as obviously uh, structured <coughs> So just to put a little bit of context, the way that IBM see artificial intelligence or cognitive information, I mean, there's one view which is more of a cynical view. I guess Elon Musk's put a little bit of a, a wry twist on that, where you have Putin suggesting that AI will control the world, and you know, it's the, it's the, I guess the the, the ultimate sort of, um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, power position. But we see it much more differently. We, and I, getting back to your point earlier, just as you said before. The ability for machines to work with, with humans, we, we look at it very much as augmenting the human experience or augmenting intelligence. And a really good example of that, this is where IBM started in AI and cognitive, was in, in healthcare and, and oncology in particular. And uh, you know, a great example is right here where you can see the analogy to geology, for example, where if you look at a melanoma, and a melanoma has six to eight different characteristics in terms of patterns, nodal, nodal uh, fragmentation, edge characteristics, colour distinction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Using the naked eye, a, a, a dermatologist typically has a 60% success rate. Using demoscopy, about 80%. Introduce AI, there's a 90 plus percent, but AI and a, a dermatologist raises that up to around 99.5%. So the same concept in geology is there. You, you, you're not replacing the, the expert. You're augmenting the capabilities by providing a much higher probabilistic outcome and insights that can be referred and, and also then uh, confirmed by the, the specialist. In other words, taking the heavy lifting away and focusing on the real uh, niche capabilities that you've been trained 20 or 30 years to, to advise on. And yes, the idea is it's, uh, you know, superhuman performance is needed to save lives. So, that's the premise that we take, and I'll give a light-hearted example. They call him the Whisperer. The Whisperer. Why do they call him the Whisperer? 
He talks to planes. He talks to planes. Watch this. Hey, Watson, what's avionics telling you? Maintenance records and performance data suggest replacing capacitor C4. Not bad. What's with the coffee maker? Sorry, we are not on speaking terms. <laughs> the point being there is it's actually referred back to a lot of, 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 of maintenance information that would be paper-based or otherwise, and also a lot of onboard production and, and electronic and, and mechanical and electrical information and arrived at that. And that's a, that's a real-world instance we're providing in, in a... In a, in a different industry, obviously, but we're doing the same in the context of mining, and and, uh, and I guess this again we're working with Rio at the moment. And Bol Batao is the CEO for their Energy and Minerals, um, and he's come out and been very strong in terms of the support of, of the introduction of such technologies. And John Hart, obviously, uh, unfortunately, isn't here, but um, you know the, the the awareness is now there. The the understanding that. In order to get the efficiencies through the value chain, remove the waste in, in terms of variability and, and uncertainty, the best way to start to do this is introduce techniques that can remove that variability and waste so waste doesn't move downstream. And the first point of that is exploration. And it is the, the most, most important opportunity to basically identify and locate the greater that ore so that you can start to shift that into the drill block and blast and also into the, the forward planning position in more real-time ways so that you can get an order order book type profile. So from a mining value chain perspective, starting at the ore, getting better, better identification of the ore, moving that through adjacent business activities is critical. And there's net, net present value benefits and dividends on a particular use case. So <coughs> this is a, a significant undertaking for all miners. And, and again, a good point, I think there was the, the example that um, Steve, uh, uh, Steve Fraser, yeah, made in terms of the identification of the pyrites, I think, in Finland, that, that, that there is a, a known fact that they believe 1,500 mineral species occur on Earth but haven't yet been discovered. And the use of analytical techniques and, and machine learning and so forth and in the context of big data can help uh, identify those. And, and again, I'm not a geologist. This may have some more relevance to yourself, but... Uh, that's the fact, I guess they're the, they're the premise about which people are, in, are starting to induce an interest in big data. So another video... Again, Mining exploration is a high risk, risk, high reward industry. It's a rush to uncover new areas to explore. A race to reach high value exploration targets faster and predict geological models with more certainty. Miners are experiencing unprecedented change. <laughs> Price volatility, rising costs, greater pressure to manage the growing volumes of data as geologists drive new discoveries. Targeting mineable ore, it is the basis of a solid mine plan and can make or break profit margins. How do miners harness more data insights and accelerate the pace to reach proven ore reserves? Goldcorp, one of the world's largest gold producers, is on a mission to transform ore body discovery. And they're doing it with IBM Watson. Watson is learning to think like a geologist, learning to understand millions of core samples, 3D models, maps, seismic surveys, and geological data. IBM Watson is empowering Gold Corp's geologists to uncover more answers because they're able to ask more questions, leading to accelerated geological insights and new levels of certainty in ore body discovery and mine planning. Over. But um, that is a two-year program uh, now. Uh, they're two years into their development. And I'll go into the use cases that they're looking at, and uh, they're very, um, I guess, extremely positive and, and also very vocal externally. I mean, the introduction and using these techniques from a, a brand perspective is very good, and perceived very positively in the market space. And Goldcorp is very, um, you know, very, very interested in promoting um, the the. the the, the value they're getting from it. And their statistics that they're quoting are in the vicinity of 97% improvements in terms of the speed to, uh, to uh, run through some of their geological assessments and so forth, whether that's automatic assaying or whether that's um, drill hole locations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So we've, we heard about the gold corps, and, but if, if we set data from a mining or exploration data set, yep. would, would our Watson 
benefit from what it's already learned from Gold Corp, or is that learning that's done with Gold Corp sorry. completely prioritizing? So where are you, sorry, where are you? Uh, Glencore. You're with Glencore, right? Okay, so we had um, uh, Alastair and um, Alastair Grubb and, um, yeah. and uh, gosh, who's the other geologist up that way? Trevor. Trevor, sure, yeah. So we went over to uh, the Watson Experience Centre in San Francisco, then went and visited Gold Pool about uh, six months ago, and sat in the session, full day session with them and traded the, the details of the, you know, to answer your question, there's, there's a number of facets to that. One is that, you know, the, the drivers are different, you know, for example, Gold, Glencore up in, in, in Mount Isa do, do log all their assays, for example, as one, one example, whereas Goldcore didn't. So they wanted to retrospectively do visual analytics and, and lithology through their assays using machine learning and statistical mm -hmm. probabilistic nature of analytics. Glencore doesn't have a, a, a strategic driver towards exploration, so capital expenditure is a challenge, whereas Goldcore does. So there's, you know, there's a whole array of different facets from commercial, commercial issues through to just the fundamental geology and deposition that you're looking at and your, your techniques. So to come back to the point, your point, is there is a framework we provide and, and that is a technology framework that's also a set of knowledge graphs that build up the semantic view of, your, of, of what is geology. So you can start to build a vocabulary of geology and then we build analytics that run through that. And those analytics typically focus on certain use cases. Is that, is that framework and analytics, is that built on or benefited from Gold Corp's information and learning experience? So, that's a very good question. So we're setting up an industry advisory council and that's a consortium. So players like Gold Corp, uh, Vale, uh, Rio, uh, even makers such as Sandvik are going to start to contribute <coughs> to basically assemble cohorts where they have common interest areas okay, sure. and that will basically the feed into that will drive a lot of the development as well as the benefits of that are a low risk commercial sort of entry point accelerated position to actually get a minimum viable product and so on and so forth okay. and the amount of IP that's each each sort of participant is interested in sharing is, is, is again a variable in that okay. and needs to be managed commercially and, sure. and so forth so there is a structure being put in place to think through those things and ultimately what we're trying to deliver you is insights, if you like, as a service. So totally sort of manage the back end, but insights as a service delivered as a cognitive tool, whether it's for sweet, sweet spot or, or, uh, or whatever the case is. Are the structure is still getting worked up? Constantly. And, and again, if you're going to invest early, you'll get a, you'll get a commercial trade-off compared to someone who invests later who gets all that contributed IP. Sure. So there's a commercial model that will suit that. Just before information, but I wasn't trying to get into that. So, <laughs> anyway, so thanks. Sorry, where are you based, by the way? Oh, I was with Trevor. Oh, you, oh, you are with Trevor, right? Okay. So, well, anyway, we, we're having discussions with yeah, Matt as well uh, at the sure. moment, so in time. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, you look, it's complex. Eh? Mining is a, is a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of services, practices, technologies continually emerging. The thrust of that is data, and data is intersecting a lot of what we normally do in terms of conventional practice. So the biggest challenge is trying to, I guess, decode that, synthesise that out into some of the fundamental components you need to manage that data. Um, and you know, we, we have a platform approach to that and, and a unified platform approach now. Um, and we find that's a very, very important play. You need to have the interoperability throughout the various levels of that platform. We premise it, as I said, on, on cognitive capabilities. I think this is the most important facet is that what we're seeing is that whereas the spend five years ago was on productivity and efficiency, it's totally shifted now to being about decision support. How can we start to accelerate the, the, the ability to make decisions and given the amount of data that we started to assemble, make them very, very quickly. So that's probably the key facet of all of this. Um, and again, you know, just a quick synopsis of some of the, the, the if you like, APIs that Watson delivers in terms of cognitive APIs from language conversion, sentiment analysis, personality insights, compare and comply for procurement or legal <coughs> analysis, <laughs> <laughs> uh, natural language, etc., to acoustic recognition, visual recognition. So all of these are very powerful things, particularly in geology, visual recognition is 
you know, block by block, if you stream through thousands of, of mag samples or block analysis and looking for a visual anomaly, then this can be quite powerful and, and speed up the, the analysis process significantly. Get, Dave, we're getting your, your data stream, yep. uh, maybe it's a bit more of the downstream, but I've heard this term, the, uh, the, uh, the, or not the Wi-Fi, but the Internet of Everything. Basically, I know GE was talking about it and others, but are all the machines that you need to monitor, basically like our modern cars that have computers that can transmit this information out? Because without that, your system, it, it's going to get starved for information. So are you having to go into operations and say, right, if you had this information, we can do this with it, but you now need to get, you know, upgrade all of your technology with your, with your providers of the mining equipment, et cetera, et cetera, to send this information out. And then once we have it, we can do something with it. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to have all the information. You need to have some, and, and you need to localise the value of that information and drive a use case from it. But yeah, the, the Internet of Things, or that, that's, Industry 4.0 is one view, GE and others have called it the industrial internet, but the premise of it is connectivity, you know, right. pervasive connectivity. And Internet of Things is a, is, a, is a management infrastructure that enables a rapid lift of that information much more efficiently, given the low cost of sensors these days compared to old the old days of, of 4 to 20 million instrumentation and so forth, of 0 to 5 volt switches and so on, the low cost sensors, the ability to lift all that information into an environment that can start to interrogate en masse and then intro introducing uh, machine learning to try to drive more high probabilistic outcomes out of that analytics is what it comes down to. But to get back to your question, you don't need to have everything instrumented. That would be the long term gain. To, to solve the data gap, to get you know the full value chain view, but focus on particularly high value wins where you know you have data rich areas and you can start to drive value out of that. So yeah, we, we do have, I guess the architecture in, in quick terms is four layers, cloud, you know, somewhere else or on-prem if need be, but ideally we can provide that as a service. And your data services, which comes back to your point is, how do we get to the edge? How do we get to that point where we're getting the raw data uh, and, and lifting that up and then going through those sequences of cleansing that data and, or ingesting it, cleansing it and so forth and preparing it into a, a view that is contextual to your role. In other words, how do I present your terms of geology or how do I present what, what it means to Glencore in terms of their operation and so forth and their exploration techniques or their drilling program. So all of these things need to be built up through the data layer and then we introduce the analytics and, and artificial intelligence layer for that third layer. And we've probably got, well, we do have the most mature level of, of what we call APIs, uh, artificial intelligent APIs for discovery, speech, conversation, document conversion, et cetera, et cetera. And out of that, we build industry solutions. So we're, we've got a management in the cloud, we've got an ability to acquire the data in a reliable way and service it long term, whether that's through IoT or Industry 4.0 or other means. And then we have an ability to work across that data and then service our industry solutions. And some of those might be what we use What's an Explorer for. So did that answer your question, by the way? Kind yeah. Of? Uh, I want to know when I can t start talking to my fridge and find out how many beer are in there and then have it ordered for me. Well, so. to get back to that point, you know, I mean, in industry, for example, particularly mining <coughs> and oil and gas, as an example, has been instrumented for decades. So we've been sampling, and we're engineers, we love to sample things, we love yeah. to measure things. So we've been doing it for decades. So really, the Internet of Things has been in existence in a, in a less uh, formalised manner for decades. We've been, we've been measuring as much as we can. So, and we've been connecting those in various different ways okay. through buses or when the, you know, the Internet came about through TCPIP and upwards. So we've been doing it for a long time. So you're not being held back in a big way? Not really. Okay. Not, not in these industries. Gotcha. You know, it's the commercial industries that typically haven't been connected. So right. retail and, and, and private industries or other industries where this thing's much more profound because they haven't had that ability to relate a lot of the, their, 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 their important assets. Right. You talk about quick decision making. Yep. Right. Quick decisions lead to more errors. Uh -huh. It's a high risk business. We make quick decisions all the time. That's right. Part of the problem, as I see with AI, is it's partly a black box. In fact, you're turning it into a line of black boxes. And once you go to a line of black boxes, the geologist doesn't understand. And they've got to make quick decisions. 
you're getting into real problem territory. Well, I guess we're not, it's not a black box for a start, but... It is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is from your perspective, but do you really want to know? I mean, b bear in mind, the only way this thing learns is by you teaching it. And that's inherent within the technology. The more you use it, the more it learns. Well, I can't get into it its brain. What do you mean? You, well, you're, you're actually creating its brain. Yeah, that's yeah. That's the difference. But you're the not programming a constrained software module. This thing is learning from the way you're using it. Sure, but the, the software packages I'm familiar with give you an answer, yep. but you can't get the thinking behind the answer. What, what is the crux of that answer? Well, this, what are the important components of it? I'll have to... Oh, I, haven't got a, I have got a video here. Uh, it's in my laptop, which this does. It provides the evidence, the reasoning, the semantics, everything. If you go, hey, Watson, uh, Woodside's a great example. Woodside have invested a lot of money in developing out through their, their exploration and appraisal activities, through their capital projects activities, through health and safety, you name it. They have a, 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 an avatar they call Willow. And it's Watson, but they're calling it Willow for whatever reason. You can talk to Willow and say, hey, Willow, tell me you know, what, what the Donaldson platform is producing today. And it goes this. And, it, and you go, well, how do you know that? And it provides all the evidence that substantiated its rationale for the delivery of that and also other possible answers based on weighted probability that you can see. And then all the semantics, in other words, all the, the, um, the, the principal foundational components from a language standpoint that it may arrive at that based on the idioms of the way you ask that question. So all of those things are presented to you and are there for your available sort of confirmation, as well as the way that machine learning does probabilistically remove a lot of that variability in error. And that's the whole point. Because on, on high volume, that's where this stuff really exceeds. Excel, sorry, is high volume, high, high, you know, high data intensity sort of query. Sorry. Um, does it also help to ask the right question? Does it help to ask the right question? Yeah, so yeah, there are advisory about things. AI, yep. The decision making. Yep. When you write the question, but really, from an education point of view, asking the right question is the key. So that's, um, again, if you look at something like compare and comply, um, compare, yes, yeah, so compare and comply. It's used a lot to one go, so we've got another mining client who's wanting to use Watson to run through all its legal procurement and publications to, to, the, to the marketing world to say, hey, am I, am, I, am I wording this correctly? Is this the best, is this the best um, I guess, the, the most effective gr grammatical way that I'm asking and expressing these things? Is this the most important question to ask? And Jeopardy is a great example, actually, of that, where I think about 10 years ago, this first came onto the Jeopardy program. And Jeopardy is all about, here's an answer, give me the question. So it's reverse logic, if you like. So yes, and, and, and obviously Watson won against all the Jeopardy, um, Jeopardy uh, champions or whatever they are. So yeah, it, it can ask the question. And, and to do that, you need to, if you like, if, there, if, there's a, if there's an answer, you need to understand the context of the question, the context of that answer, the probable questions that would arrive at that answer, in the context of the grammatical structure and the semantics that you were presented and the idioms of the language itself, to be able to then go back and say, what's the most likely question for that answer? So yes, it can. And inherently, that's what it, that's... Sorry, if I can have one more comment. Yeah, yeah. I think the most important thing is that I, I think the humans, uh, the intelligence is something that we are nervous that yeah. it might actually overtake us one day, like I've got all in the day, actually learn from ourselves. Now, if the what a uh, system like Watson can provide humans of some learning experiences rather than just helping us with the uh, answers. Um, do you actually have any plan on how to actually generate knowledge that can actually help humans to learn from them as well? Yeah, um, look, there is, um, again, this is getting quite sort of abstract questions, but that, that is a very important point in terms of the way it can sort of assist as an advisory. Uh, and again, there's a lot of work in terms of um, given a certain practice, uh, whether that's um, particularly in HR, for example. You know, how do I best manage a person of this personality and how do you determine what their personality is? Giving some <coughs> advice based on 
the data, you know, the access to whatever level of information globally you had based on the characteristics for that role for this particular scenario, based on these environmental conditions at this day, et cetera, et cetera. How do I, what's the best implementation approach? Again, that depends on the maturity. You, 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 you know, you, this, this would have to be quite a mature implementation, but in HR particularly, it seems that you know, managing and getting the best advice as to how to progress professionally or behaviourally to get the best out of people is something that, that is being used quite a lot. Um, so sentiment, uh, emotion, empathy, things like this really are, they're, they're, they're there, they're APIs that are there that start to constitute the way that we, are, we as people interact and think and behave. So you get back to your other question, you know, there's a lot of concern about will this thing take over? Well, uh, you know, I think it's, again, the, the, the default answer to that is, well, look, it's augmenting, it's not replacing, there's no closed loop activity or intent to make this a closed loop sort of, uh, you know, it's, it observes, formulates and then drives an outcome. The, the human would always intercede that, is the, is the sort of policy at this stage. Now going forward, again, you know, we've had the Industrial Revolution, for example, where a whole, you know, a whole epoch of people, an epoch was changed and new services, new capabilities, new roles were created. The same notion is here with machine learning or AI. You know, AI is the new IT is the, is the slogan. And the intent is that out of this will be born a whole, I guess, a whole dimension of different roles to support the development of and support of AI in its various multitude of, of, um, of instantiations. Anyway, so I'll keep going. It's not Skynet, what's what you're saying. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was my view yet, so. Um, so I guess just to give a quick example, a very simple one where one of the one of the areas of Watson is called Watson Explorer, and you know it's probably the most accessible part of it is that if you imagine it, you know you've got a, you've got something that's connected to all different data sources, whether that's a structured geological data source like Leapfrog, or whether that's AutoCAD, or whether that's a content management system of of, of record, or whether that's you know out in the the broader world of, of um, government geological reference data or, or whatever. Weather is, an, is another really good example. Weather starting to, is probably the second, second most influential uh, impact on our economy behind the financial markets. So weather is very, very important. And if we have a weather channel, in fact, in IBM, that it provides extremely <coughs> high predictable weather patterns that can start to be used in conjunction with operations. And uh, particularly in mining, startups, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, stop downs for high weather conditions is, is starting to play very important. So anyway, this effectively Watson streams across all this data, and it's a very very useful tool. So just to quickly run through what we were trying to do here. Obviously, we've got a problem. Geologists spend eighty percent more of their time searching for cleaning, preparing data. Uh, we've got siloed information. You've got uh, massive data quantities and, and air quality, I guess, industry data structures. So eighty percent of your time you, you're running through spreadsheets or whatever. Um, digging out old DCs from your library and looking at stress drain sort of characteristics and of, of a uh, geological or geophysical system. So, and you're trying to create those outputs. So, in, in, in short terms, what we're doing is enabling high performance queries across the data set. So, you know, without getting too much under the, under the bonnet, the intent is to take that burden away and drive out the same outcomes through a human I guess a humanly instinctive interaction with something rather than having to program something in a, in a very non-intuitive way. And through those simple queries, through geospatial queries and complex geospatial queries, the, the, I guess 33 times faster than traditional methods is, is what, we're, what we're sort of trying to benchmark. But what we come back with, the feedback from Goldcorp, is actually they, they believe they're getting 90% faster uh, queries than before. And, and as of, and this is from Louis, Louis uh, Kemp and uh, Kenneth Howard, he's their Vice President of Technology. So they're about to um, use that in terms of um, uh, drill targets and start to actually use whatever the, you know, the, the underlying techniques they're using, but also using a lot of the unstructured information in support of that as well. Um, and then a predictive element to it. So we can start to work with, as I said, so Leapfrog, for example, using that information that we've created by by having the, um, the uh, access and correlation and then predicting what might happen from the predictive mod modeling module in terms of um, uh, geological data <coughs> ingestion from the, that, that assembly of data we've created, geospatial query accelerators, 
interfacing to leaf problem and driving through the, the machine learning, etc. And then also, this is the Yamana Gold example, also interfacing to other external things such as the universities and, and, and academia, papers that have been generated. And again, this, this came out of a lot of the medical developments in IBM where you know, specialists at John, John Hopkins University in particular were spending an inordinate amount of time every morning trying to work across, you may have seen it on 60 Minutes, work across you know, the, the incredible amount of new research that's being published daily to ensure and then start to collaborate around tables and swap ideas and consuming a lot of time rather than being on the patient and just asking the question and getting the answer, so to speak. Same in geology, surely and the same in other professional and, and academic pursuits. So anyway, getting back to the, the example of, of WEX, a very simple example was to identify co-relationships between keyword <coughs> phrases and aliases within your AOC of digitised documents. And we say Watson's corpus, that's the end result of the assembly of all of these different data sources through semantic graphs, knowledge graphs, and sticking it in something that over time builds up and importantly, getting back to your question, the more you use it, the more this builds and the more it is a reflection of your business and very unique to your business. You can't transplant that and stick that in another operation because it's reflective of your culture, your processes, your people, your operation, etc., etc., etc. So a very important characteristic is the more you use it, the more it is sticky to your business and unique IP that can't be reused. Um, so what's an explorer? Basically, as I said, unstructured content in terms of collaboration information, emails, uh, content management, cloud information, web information, as well as structured data, and, and then generating, I guess, uh, capabilities from that in terms of dashboards, etc. And a, a multitude of different languages supported, and that's increasing over time. The outcome of that, sorry, the, the outcome was that we, or sorry, the, the input was the fact that we had this amount of data sources you know, 100,000 documents and that many folders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of structured and unstructured. So AutoCAD, uh, DBase files and so forth, trying to work across all that. How do I get all this information in? How do I actually start to work out what is geological information? How do I classify that geological information? And how do I start to, to, to work through that information? So Watson and Wex, the Watson Explorer, uh, went and across those 300-odd thousand different data sets, uh, took 12 days to ingest all of that information, unstructured and structured. So you can imagine if you sat there with a team of geologists trying to work through that information, you'd be there for years. So that's an immediate quick turn down. And then another four days later, it had, it, uh, after the ingestation it had, uh, and, uh, and knowledge graph creation, it had done the correlation, understood the relevance based on keywords and so forth. That you set up, you know, you, you want to know that copper is copper or cooper or CU, etc., and you build up that association and very, very rapidly, exponentially, Watson very, very quickly understands and can then stream through the rest of it once it's been taught. So there's about a 15% time allocation to teaching. The rest of it, it just does and knows. Well, I, I guess in terms of inputs, one of the things that I think as an audience we're concerned about is that there's some actual factual information, say geochemistry or yep. physical observations. Yep. But there's then there's more subjective information yep. that might fall more in the geological domain where a rock type is called something, you know, 30 years ago, yep. but it's been changed. Do, do, it, does Watson come back and say, I find a conflict, guide me through to say what I should be <coughs> terming this? So yeah. going forward, you have some sort of consistent <coughs> mentorship. So there is a, a visual tool that does that uh, okay. as part of works where you do set up so that in getting down to semantic nomenclature there's a thing called same as and it's quite a, a distinct determinator as to what is the same as something so if it's yellow if it, if it quacks if it has got feathers and it waddles it, it waddles it's a duck uh, so you can sort of set up those inferences and those same as rules for a start and then it will also based on what are called other spin <coughs> rules and higher order meta rules can also infer what might be related and it will promote those to you as well. So I think this is this might be, you know, pyrites or this might be sort of gold or this might be iron. Yeah, I'm not sure. So what do you think? Uncertainty, yeah. And that presents it in a very visual way. So you can quickly say yes or no and then on it goes and streams through the rest. But the point of that is four days later it's 56 geological phrases and five category groupings and then we've got the expert in to validate it. 
before you moved on to the next 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 stage and said, okay, now we're going to classify further. And there's obviously in the tool itself, there's the capability to filter, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down through to, um, and if I had the demo here, I could show you. So that's area selection criteria, are they fixed or can they be changed on a constant basis? Uh, good question. I honestly don't know. I'm imagining, I'm imagining changed. I wouldn't be able to, you know, I'm not the person who's the tool expert here, so, um, but I imagine change, I imagine that flexibility is there. Um, but, um, Do you think it'll have the ability to identify one person might be more expert than another, so it doesn't learn from a, a non-expert? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is that's an important characteristic that it does, is that the, 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 so you can, I mean, the fact that your person is, is irrelevant to what's in you, you're an entity, and that entity has, has facts. <laughs> Uh, and 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 things associated with that, that that entity as well. So the fact that you know David <coughs> is a man, David is from IBM, David lives in Brisbane, David is a name, etc., etc., etc. You're building up a vocabulary. That's the semantic graph. It doesn't matter. So if that <coughs> if that semantic graph of me performs better by every time I use this and ask these questions and I get more hyper probabilistic outcomes, then I get, could get a rating, for example. So. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, how do you know how much information you need to carry out a particular task? Because there might be cases where you're overfitting because of the <coughs> information. Sorry, you're over. Uh, you're overfitting or overpredicting. Um, yes. And so how do you know that that's the optimal information you're providing to get the best results? Well, it, the, the only you get a, a, a number of weightings. It, 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 it gives a, 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 a an evidential weighting of, in terms of what it's found and will give you potentially however many number of possible outcomes that you rank in terms of what's required to meet your criteria. And it might say, this is 86%. I'm 86% sure this is correct. And that, the basis of that is based on the analytical techniques behind it, the you know, statistical sort of regression, or whatever you're using, as well as the machine learning probabilistic sort of maturity as well. So that's all the math behind it suggests this is the outcome that we believe is about 86%. This other this is another possible outcome that's at 74%, this one's at 83.4%. You know, and so you can look at those and based on your expertise, can say actually, oh, I think that's the one. And then you would re-rank that. And then Watson would go, oh, okay, that's been re-ranked. I better sort of add, you know, refactor that in certain ways. So, <coughs> um, so yes, yeah, so moving, moving on. So anyway, the point about it is all of those things on the left are the typical ways of doing it on the right. You know, and this is important, new data, as soon as you add new data, it's re-indexing constantly. <coughs> so it's, it's adding to that knowledge constantly without you having to do anything. So, you know, it's an efficiency. And that's the principal, principal value, is that it's an efficiency and it's importantly giving you more confidence and de-risking your decisions, not replacing them. So that's the important part. It still needs to be taught. And I guess the, 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 what we do at IBM is, whether it's healthcare or, or geology or finance or, or uh, reservoir engineering, is we have SMEs that teach these modules as part of what we deliver as a, as a, as a, as a product, if you know. And then it's up to you to refactor that based on your business and your operation and so forth. Um, so Gold Corp's a good example. So they, as you, again, invested heavily. They've, sorry. No. They've got a, I guess, a 2021 strategy, grow productivity by 20%, uh, grow reserve by 20%, and reduce their AISC, um, excuse me, by 20%. Um, and a lot of that comes down to, you know, productivity improvements through operations, uh, health and safety, uh, as well as identification of all. Um, and they've set out a, a two-year program um, to, and six key use cases, aggregated, aggregation analysis of company geological data is done, visualization is done, um, and we're up to using the predict goal. So we, they've broken into structured and unstructured data, and ideally the fusion of those will occur as well. Uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube and the web from Gold Corp of, of, of the value of these. Uh, the breakdown, just a little bit more background. I mean, these slides will be shared in any way, so you can you refer back to these as you need to. Um, but they have a predict gold outside ore body, they have a predict sweet tube to get 
a quick ROI, uh, and they have uh, aggregation numbers, <coughs> they're structured, and then they have paper synthesis, uh, paper Q&A, and, and geological debate. The geological debate is an interesting one yet to be realised, but you know, if, if to get back to your point, we'll create the thesis, if you like. Um, so it will answer those, or ask, ask those questions and answer them as well. So there's a lot of, I guess, uh, aptitude. Again, these are big, these are investments, and they take time, they take a proper governed program, and, and you know, a, a, a mandate down to get them going. They're not something that you can just have a, a $10,000 budget to start to uh, undertake. So, um, the other fact, thing I want to mention is, is uh, quantum computing. So, 20 to 2021, we'll be releasing our first quantum computer, which again is a game changer in terms of the ability to process and to computate. Another order, again, in terms of what we're able to do. So, that will change the game again. So, if you look at the roadmap, uh, typical roadmap that we're looking at for raw body modelling, for example, looking at geolo uh, geology data platform, build, put the platform in, understand and mine the document analysis through WEX, as we showed you before, start predicting whole assay values, for example, call photo analysis through photo analytics and visual analytics, uh, predict into whole assay values, validate targets, increased accuracy, so your, your campaigns and so forth um, uh, are much more effective, predict new target, and also then introduce quantum AI mineralogy algorithms. So uh, that's... The sort of roadmap that we're using with uh, some of the miners that are now onboarding, um, where Goldcorp obviously has started to to um, to lead the way in this in this in this way. Am I going time-wise, by the way? About five minutes. Yep. So I can go for a deep dive. I probably won't. Um, again, these will be all available to you on the handouts. Um, So just to, just to round out sort of our thinking in, in mining broadly, uh, so what we, you might have seen this from Peter Durant White, he's a, a, an eminent data scientist at the Sydney, University of Sydney, but he presented this paper at Oxford quite a, a few years ago on the back of a lot of work with Rio Tinto and their work in the Pilbara. Um, in, and they were looking to really reduce variability throughout their value chain. So he examined some key traditional um, uh, activities from you know, your resource drilling, ge geological models, core logging, etc., right through to plan assay and, and commercialisation. And he plotted a, 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 a basis of reduction in uncertainty by introducing digitisation. In other words, uh, automating, connecting, and integrating a lot of the, the, the traditional practices in a more comprehensive, uh, platform oriented fashion with a lot more higher, uh, higher capability and performance. So you can see the reduction in variability is obviously fairly significant, particularly when you start to get into the variability of fleet production, where you, 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 you're, uh, you drill block and blast leads into the haulage and you, you don't know the fragmentation that well. The fragmentation is unreliable. The pickup of ore is unreliable in terms of grading and the movement of that to the mill, etc., is, is prone to variability, not just in the scheduling, but also in the quality. And then you've got energy management hits through the mill because of different fragmentation, etc. So he, he went through that and looked at those areas there. What we have done, and, and this is the basis of our thinking and strategy in mining, is we've, we've taken each of those traditional points, and we haven't tried to, to reprocess the, the mine value chain. That's not our game. What we've tried to do is to say, look, if we look at these digitised areas, because IBM, we can go in and digitise. That's table stakes for IBM. We are going to add a cognitive view on these, and, and we went back to IBM Research, and they then plotted what it would look like if we then went and added our cognitive advisors at each of those points. And again, you can see the variability goes down. And variability throughout the value chain relates to cost, risk, safety, etc., and opportunity cost. In other words, uh, potential to deconstruct value. So, you know, these are, again, relatively research-bound um, analytical uh, techniques, constrained models, not not uh, supervised models, not unsupervised, but, um, but the point being, I think, you know, the, the visuals speak quite, quite, uh, quite heavily in terms of the potential value. And so this is our strategy, is not just at the ore body where a lot of, you know, NPV is available, the ore budget can be, you know, can be realised potentially or get close to realised. If you look at Mount Isa, for example, your ore budget's 
almost bigger, I think it's bigger than Broken Hill, it's about 40 plus billion, isn't it, at Mount Isa? Oh, the OPEX? No, the all budget itself. Oh, the in-ground in resource? Yeah. Um, oh, that's commercial. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, well, that was, it was shared with me, but anyway. <laughs> So anyway, a lot, of, a lot of potential there and often not realised. So we, we, I guess we have a position across the value chain. So just to give you a quick snapshot, each of those areas we're building out cognitive advisors under that advisory council basis. Some of these are in production, some of these are in minimal byproduct, some are in proof of concept, but they're all on their way. <coughs> and our value prop is you know, improving productivity, removing and reducing that uncertainty basis, and then scaling expertise, really enabling the operator to do more, or the, the geologist to do more, or the metallurgist to do more, with you know taking that 80% of the heavy lifting away and enabling what they were doing 20% of the time to be doing 80% of the time instead. <coughs> and there's a value prop there as well. I won't go through the actual um, value driver tree, but uh, there is some figures behind all these things and a method of going forward. Um, which Again, you can talk through it at another time. But anyway, that's the net sum of it. So there's some interesting things being done. It's still early days, but we're getting some really good results. And there's a, you know, in 10 or 20 years' time, I think the, the, the shape will be, again, quite profound. So thanks very much. Thanks, David.